Four sports, four leaders and four perspectives on different aspects of the process of coming back from COVID. We'll be joined by Troy Vincent of the NFL to talk about getting player buy-in for your plan. Chloe Target Adams from Formula One to explain exactly how fans are being brought back into venues right now. And Stacey Allister to talk about bubbles within bubbles within bubbles. I'm, I'm sure we're all au okay fait with bubbles, but maybe not quite so many. Uh, she'll be talking about the US Open. But first, I'd like to welcome uh, Tom Harrison, Chief Executive of the ECB. Tom, are you there? Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Good morning to you, Tom. Uh, a fantastic uh, tropical background you've got there. Are you, are you in the West Indies? I'm not. No, I'm in southwest London. Um, but it, uh, it does sort of brighten the days when you're uh, working from home, as we all have been for uh, quite an extended period now. Yes, indeed. Um, lovely to have you with us, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to focus in on uh, touring, um, the process of um, putting together um, tours in the <coughs> age of COVID. You guys at the ECB brought four touring sides over here to England um, to play series against the England men's team. Um, against, obviously, the backdrop of social restrictions, travel restrictions, uh, also a rather specific and descriptive uh, criticism of cricket by our esteemed <coughs> Prime Minister. Um, how did you manage it, Tom? Yeah, uh, well, look, um, I think the, the thing that happened very early on in the pandemic, uh, bearing in mind the timing of this, right? So it hit us square in front of the start of our season, um, kind of March, April time, where we're normally um, just putting the finishing touches to our, uh, our summer season. Uh, that's when the pandemic really hit us. And, and I think what, what that led us to understand is that our ability to navigate the crisis to any successful level uh, and, and not give us a financial crisis which would be uh, completely unsustainable for us would be linked with our ability to bring international teams into this country. And, and it's worth bearing in mind that the business model for, for our sport is not a club-based model, it's, a, it's an international-based model. So we, um, our ability to survive the crisis, frankly, was uh, intrinsically linked with our ability to bring international teams into this country. And that just meant shifting our mindset and our thinking from being one about high performance uh, and one about delivering events to being one about uh, safety. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're looking at uh, everything through that lens, uh, it essentially changes a great deal um, of the, the way in which you operate. Suddenly your operations with government become front of mind as opposed to your, uh, your, your stakeholder partnerships, which would normally be first base. Uh, we had to change pretty much everything uh, that we understood about putting uh, events on uh, and then effectively build these plans which we uh, started to seed into uh, into our own government and then obviously to overseas governments to enable them to have confidence that what we were presenting was effectively uh, a model which guaranteed players safety and staff safety from uh, wheels up uh, in their own country uh, to uh, effectively wheels down again when they were returned to their country, which in some cases was nine, nine or ten weeks later. Um, remember, our sport is is based on international teams traveling around the world, the world spending long periods of time uh, in those countries, touring around those countries. So uh, effectively, it's a kind of um, anti-COVID model. And uh, if there's a format of any sport that's not designed to operate in a pandemic, then it's probably Test cricket. Um, but it enabled us to. Uh, to have a kind of no holds barred approach to player safety uh, and an ability really to work very closely with our government and with overseas government to say uh, you know our ability to survive this is is literally linked with um, uh, you know the, uh, the, the 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 ability for us to play these matches and in the, in the end we managed to get 47 days of international cricket across the line um, effectively pioneering uh, an international biosecurity model um, which uh, which we did, and you know, the, the, it went well. But um, it's not like we're anywhere near through this crisis yet. And uh, um, as other sports have highlighted, you know, the next six months are, are fraught with danger. Uh, cricket in this country is no different from that. Uh, facing a pretty bleak winter uh, with the events and conferencing business uh, all but shut down. Uh, so we have tough times ahead. Even though I think we've achieved um, a certain amount this year and, uh, and managed to stave off disaster frankly from um uh but we're, we're by, by no means through it mm -hmm. 
Um, we'll, we'll come to uh, sort of what's coming up and, and the future momentarily, but I think it's worth saying um, that, the, that what you pulled off this summer, particularly impressive given that, as we all know, a cricket ball itself is a vector for disease. Um, and and you, you, touched on the, you touched on the sort of uh, government relations aspect there and sort of moving from uh, focusing on normal kind of internal <coughs> stakeholders that you do at the ECB to sort of full focus on um, governments, uh, both here in uh, the UK, but also abroad. Um, sounded like that was quite a challenging um, aspect. What was and remains your, your approach to that? Yeah, look, I, th I think right from the start, uh, when you're uh, when you're going through this uh, uh, public health crisis, I think your your mindset shifts again. When you when you understand the role that government play in this, effectively they hold the keys to anything happening. So right from the start, and uh, you know, I'll go into this in a second, but our, you know, one of the mantras that we had through this crisis was, in order for us to keep cricket sustainable in this country for the long term, we have to work in partnership with people, and perhaps the most uh, obvious partnership of all is, is with our government um, as the primary stakeholder that's going to hold the keys really to us being able to achieve anything. Um, so, you know, that, that, that was a fundamental uh, uh, element for us to work in partnership with government and not be seen to, to be lobbying government, uh, but, but to build trust with them. So when we had challenges around uh, perceptions of uh, whether our sport was safe or not, we built evidence uh, we we ran we we funded studies or we managed to get uh, studies funded to get the scientific answer to questions that uh, we were being asked about whether there were elements of our sport which were unsafe. Um, you know, putting a virus onto a cricket ball and seeing how it behaved is one of those things that we did, um, so that we could take evidence back to government to say actually we 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 really do believe our sport is safe. And I think that enabled us to build trust. Um, we also worked. You know, I use this phrase uh, slightly tongue in cheek, but behind closed doors with government. You know, this is not uh, a negotiation that really or a discussion indeed that should happen in the public gaze. So we were very careful about how we operated with government um, and built that relationship, built trust. And we continue to try and operate in that way because ultimately what central government is facing um, is dealing with this pandemic on a, a nationwide basis. That is a massive responsibility where people are dying in their hundreds actually going back into the peak of this pandemic when we were putting our plans together. And so for, for them to put our, their trust into, frankly, a sport which is, uh, you know, not their major concern, uh, their major concern is public safety, uh, you know, but for us to build that trust and to build that uh, relationship with government was, was crucially important. And it enabled us therefore to go to overseas governments and have the same kind of conversation with them and start to build up uh, that relationship as well. Uh, in the West Indies case, for example, you're talking about eight separate governments uh, from the Caribbean islands um, in a COVID-free environment back in, uh, in June and, uh, and May of this year when we're putting these plans together. So um, our challenge was to convince players to come from a COVID-free environment into a country which was seen certainly in cricketing terms as being in the eye of the storm. Uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of our summer or the early part of our summer in May and June, uh, and that's why the focus on uh, on safety was so acute, um, and a huge amount of communication, obviously with um, overseas boards, but obviously, you know, from our medical staff and our event staff to players before they boarded planes over here to uh, to effectively answer questions, to demystify what the bubble was going to be like, what it was going to be like to to be in a hotel. Uh, effectively, you know, with, with a lot of rules that they weren't used to um, for a long period of time. That was um, stuff that uh, the players needed to get their head around and be Tom, mentally I've gotta, prepared. I've just, sorry, I've just got to uh, interrupt you in full flow there. We've got one minute left, and I did want to come on to um, the, the future. Um, how has this challenge evolved, and, and what, do, what do future tours look like? Yeah, look, I think for the future, obviously, we are in a, 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 a difficult place because our, our sport revolves around uh, uh, this international challenge. But uh, I think our focus will continue to be uh, to have that global responsibility to, to keep the business of international cricket going. But only once we're comfortable that safety measures are in place and that we can be confident that those uh, that those uh, uh, measures that, uh, that that are that are uh, that have been agreed are in place uh, before we ask players to 
uh, to go on these tours. So there's an awful lot to do. Uh, we've used the mantra of, of plan early and decide late um, all the way through this uh, crisis, and we'll continue to do that and uh, make sure that uh, we're communicating uh, as uh, effectively as we can be with our stakeholders, with our players, everyone concerned, to ensure that we can, uh, we can continue to operate effectively through this crisis. Tom Harrison, uh, Chief Executive of the ECB, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time and for your candor. Uh, Tom, I think, is going to stay on the platform for the next 30 minutes for the duration of this session. So any questions you have for him, pop them in the box and he will do his best to get back to you. Now, though, we're going to hear from Troy Vincent, who is EVP of Football Operations at the NFL. He spoke to David Kushnan earlier, just, uh, just a, a day or two, actually, before the NFL took the decision to postpone games this weekend. Uh, what have you and the NFL learned from an operational perspective in these first few weeks of the season? So, so David, what, what we've learned at the National Football League after three weeks of play is of over community, the importance of reminding everyone the why. Why is it important to follow the protocols and the processes that were put in place through our medical experts? And that has to be, we have to be vigilant on everyday protocols and processes and that constant communication with everyone in the building. And as you were mapping out how on earth to actually make this season happen, safely and securely, of course, they will have been your top priorities. What kind of dialogue took place with your, your various key stakeholders, uh, players, broadcast crews, etc.? Well, it, I would say it doesn't work without the players. So the players were involved in their leadership from the very beginning. It's important that the key stakeholders in this particular case, your players, your broadcast partners, and your principal owners, when the three are all involved, that inclusive process of why, what it would take, being reasonable, at the same time saying, okay, what has our medical guidelines from the White House, from our joint medical committee, what has been put in place, and is it reasonable? And also, what one of the, another thing that's very important, key stakeholders had to understand going in that we have to be flexible and remain flexible. Every week we're learning a little something new and to share that so those best practices could be spread league-wide. Paint a picture for us. For the players, how different is it playing in the NFL this season versus last season? Well, just, just begin with there was no off-season. So everything was virtual. So from the time you started, you normal. Again, that third or fourth week in March, you were doing everything. All your studying, there was no on field activity. Meeting new teammates, being introduced to a new system, those things have been different. You get into the season, there's no fans. So you have a handful of stadiums that have fans. You're now walking around with contact tracers. You're getting everyday testing. So all of this is out of a normal routine, quite frankly, from what you've ever seen, the players have ever seen over the last 15, 20 years. And what was the, um, what was the dialogue like with the players and, and how much input did they have as you were formulating exactly what the protocols would be and, and how you could make the season happen securely and safely? Well, was, Dave, the players were critical. They were the foundation. Without the players, there's no game. So it was critical that they hear, and like everyone else, globally, there was a global pandemic that was, that's happening, and we're still in the middle of it. The players were seeing lives being lost. Public safety was at the, at the forefront. Their family safety was at the forefront. So they were critical in the implementation and the development and the design of our practices and protocol doesn't work, will not work without the player's input. 
You mentioned uh, that you're learning a lot week by week, game by game, I'm sure. Um, what have you learned so far and, and how does that kind of information, that new information feed into what must be an ever evolving plan for the remainder of the season? So one of the things that we're tracing is just simple travel calls. We can see from club to club as they travel, as they implement spacing, whether it's on a bus, on an airplane, if people are congregating uh, within small groups in a short period of time, long period of time, the way people conduct their meals, the way they conduct, uh, conduct their travel on the road at the hotel. So we're learning what works and what doesn't work. And they're simple things that we, we've been able to, to see through technology to allow us to share with clubs who haven't traveled, who had not traveled yet. Here's some things that we learned from other 10 clubs that traveled in week two or week one that you may want to implement um, to have better success or mitigate risk. How additionally challenging is it to be operating in a, a market as large as the United States where not only you have a, a national policy, a national guideline, but you obviously have state by state and in some cases very large differences state by state in terms of uh, the approach and the response to the pandemic? So the different states, you have different county ordinances We've took all of those things were considered as we put, let's just say the foundation or the basis of our protocols, knowing that they have a state or two or a county or a city, they may have a little bit different ordinance after a, a, a oblige by. This allows us, again, in communicating, we have to be flexible. We got two cities, San Francisco and Buffalo at the time, where they're their protocols, their, strict, their state restrictions supersede some of the protocols where facial, face, uh, facial PPEs on the sidelines. And in other places, that may not be the case. So it is being flexible, learning what each state is requiring, and that is the floor. It's about public safety. From a personal perspective, you are largely responsible for a lot of this. Um, I wanted to ask you um, how much that has weighed on you during this period and as you, you move through the season. What, what's it been like for you? Well, I've had to, for myself, I've had to be flexible. I have become a great listener and making sure not only my staff, but that we're over communicating. People want to know what's going on. So for me personally, navigating at home with my wife and children, making sure that I'm listening, we're learning, and then that we can lead. And that's been, you know, frankly, you know, you have to be on the phone, being important that we actually hearing what people are saying that is actually happening real time and being able to just, and not being as stringent in some areas based off of the information that we're getting back. And from a, a league standpoint, how important, given the NFL's status as the number one league in the United States, one of the biggest uh, sports leagues around the world, sports events around the world, um, to be seen to be setting the tone in terms of the, um, the level of security and safety and the, uh, the level of protocols that you're putting in place? Well, we believe that we can be a model. And being that model is what we've learned from our medical experts. And sticking to the lines that have put, been put in place. That's one of the things that when we talk about week to week, what's been challenging is to reminding the clubs, the players, the coaches, myself included, about trial protocols, about when we go, when we get, get to the facility, the, adhering to the things Spacing, PPEs, hand washing, distancing, all of those things allow us on Sunday, Mondays, and Thursdays to just be an example of what it can be to go back, not just playing, but returning to work safely. Under, we're all under the same conditions. So we have an opportunity to be in an example 
um, every week about how you do it responsibly. Well, we wish you as quiet a remainder of the season as it's possible to, to be. Troy Vincent, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. And God bless you all. Apologies for any uh, connectivity issues that are coming through on the feed there. I don't know whether that was Troy or David, but I'll be having words with both of them, rest assured. Um, so, from government relations and touring parties by way of getting uh, buy-in from the players at the NFL, we arrive at our next discussion, how to bring fans back. And I'm delighted to be joined down the line by Chloe Target-Adams, Global Director of Race Promotion at Formula One. Chloe, are you there? Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you, Chloe. Uh, it looks like a sort of murky London day behind you. Am I, am I right? Yeah, it, well, it's a bit mixed, but I'm actually in the office, which is, um, it feels like a really great place to be at this point in the year. Indeed, indeed. Um, Chloe, let's get stuck in. Um, set the scene for us, if you would. What's the state of play for Formula One in terms of a uh, return to normality? Well, we're really pleased to have returned to racing. We were the first international sport um, to restart when we started in July um, with closed door events. We've now delivered 10 races in eight countries in 13 weeks, and we're on our 11th race this weekend in Nürburgring in Germany. Um, we're very pleased to have started to welcome some fans back from Mugello. And in terms of where we're rating this year, we, we hope to race in 17 destinations um, overall, have 17 races. We've had five new races join our calendar as one of the, I would call it, opportunities of COVID. Uh, Mugello, Nürburgring, Portugal, Imola and Istanbul. We've had some double headers and the infamous triple headers of three races in a row, which obviously is a is a no mean feat for F1 teams and, and personnel and our personnel. We've had, um, you know, a, a whole new way of working this year with COVID protocols and testing. 52,000 tests we've conducted so far this season and counting. They need 24 positives in four months. So it shows that we are safe. We are returned. We have returned to racing and um, now we're bringing fans back as safely as possible. Mm. Um, and as you say, the, you sort of laid it out there, the operational um, achievement inherent in coming back, um, quite outstanding. And it seems to me that probably the concept of bringing fans back into a venue for you as Formula One, the central rights holder, maybe quite low down on your list. You know, you've got this uh, traveling circus that you have to get around the world um, safely and securely. You've got all sorts of stakeholders that you need to um, get buy-in from in order to do that. You did um, mention bringing fans back um, at Mugello. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that fans have come back for the last couple of races. We, we saw a lot of fans in Sochi mm -hmm. in um, Russia. Broad question, I'm afraid, but how are you, how are you doing it? How are you working with uh, promoters to bring fans back? Well, it's, it's taken a huge amount of planning. You know, we very much are taking a safety first approach. It's obviously got to be in line with what's possible in that location. Um, and, you know, government approval, stakeholder approval is absolutely critical. Um, Alongside that, it's how we work collectively with our promoters. Um, you know, having fans back at our races is a priority. It, it's still a driver, you know, both from a commercial perspective, but also from a, you know, longer term perspective of where we want our sport to be and in terms of appealing to fans. But as I said, safety first is paramount. So in Mugello, it was possible to have a limited number, which felt like a huge achievement. Um, and Mugello Circuit, our promoter there, did a phenomenal job. Timing was also a critical issue um, as to when approvals can be given. It's obviously a complex and changing environment in different country countries. In Mugello, approvals were given very close to the event. And we had around three and a half thousand people attend. 
in Sochi, we were able to get with working with the promoter, those approvals slightly earlier. And across the weekend, we had 55,000 fans. So obviously a very different proposition. Um, some of the challenges in that is obviously how you plan for that in terms of spectator experience, fan journey. Everything obviously has to be virtual, digital, contactless experience from the gate in. And what kind of you know entertainment can you provide? There's obviously Formula One on track and, and support races we have, but where we're used to having fan zones, experience tours, hospitality, we've again had to work through those with our events team, our operational team, our promoter, um, and just figure out a new model, a, a new way of working. And I think it's part of that ongoing learning experience because what's key is obviously this will continue next year, possibly longer. So it, it is about that flexibility, that adaptation, but it's um, it's been, you know, a great achievement to have fans back and we're looking at the next couple of races with fans but the situation changes constantly you know yesterday we found out that unfortunately for our turkish race with the situation there the government has announced that it's no longer possible for us to have fans so that will be a closed door event we had our promoter had sold 65,000 tickets so obviously refunds are in place communication with our fans is paramount um, and how we can hopefully have those fans tuning in, whether via TV, um, media, social, digital channels to participate in the event that way. Mm. It seems to me that there are a lot of um, variables from, uh, from track to track, from promoter to promoter. As you mentioned, you, you, were, um, you brought some, uh, a small number of fans back um, at Magello and then uh, a relatively large number of fans back at Sochi. And I think... Um, you sold sort of 60 or 70,000, or the Turkish promoter had sold 60 or 70,000 uh, for this upcoming race, obviously refunds in place. Um, it strikes me that probably for Formula One, you've spent so long communicating with um, everyone that's in the bubble that's going around the world. You've been talking about uh, over-communicating uh, around safety protocols um, as, as people sort of travel around. You've been talking uh, to partners about how they can get value out of this new way of racing. And then suddenly fans are back. It strikes me that you know, the reaction of those people in the bubble is probably going to be a mixture of fantastic, this is really exciting, but also mm -hmm. probably nervousness and uh, trepidation that suddenly, you know, there's, it seems like there's more danger uh, at these events. How are you kind of mitigating that or sort of treading that fine line between um, excitement uh, but also not coming across as reckless? Uh, absolutely. As I said, it's a safety first approach. Um, zoning is a key part. So we maintain the biosphere, the bubble of the critical working areas, our RF1 race paddock, you know, testing continues is paramount. Access is not enabled for, um, for people to those areas unless they are part of that biosphere bubble. Um, we have a different um, zoning aspect for hospitality, our, our VIP program, Paddock Club, that we're starting to bring back from our Portuguese race, which is at the end of October, um, and then onwards. And again, with different testing regimes for that, obviously guests attending won't um, be tested, but we're operating on the basis similar as you would going to a local restaurant. So again, it's in line with government procedures in that area. Our staff who will be operating the paddock club with our wonderful partner, Doe & Co, who we've worked with for many years. Um, equally, they will be tested regularly because I think it's about consumer confidence. And it's about creating mini bubbles within those areas so that if there is a problem, we can isolate that problem, pull out the problem and mitigate the risk to our best ability. Um, and likewise, in fan areas, it's communication. It's working with our promoters in line with what local government advice is on mask wearing, on hand sanitization, on contactless elements of the spectator journey insert into and outside of the circuit and it, it's the difficulty of merging the kind of f1 
practices which obviously may be higher than what is the norm in that country because of the COVID situation being different in that country and the cultural custom and norm. For example, um, in some locations, um, mask wearing is, is very, very normal. People wear it everywhere. People will sit in a grandstand wearing a mask. In other locations, that's not necessarily required um, or expected. So it's how we can encourage people to do that with additional stewarding, with handing out F1 branded masks, um, and just making sure that it's key that fans attending the event feel safe and that you know necessary safety measures are in place so that attending is a fun, exciting, exhilarating experience. Mm. Um, Chloe, we're, we're just about out of time, so I'm going to give you a, uh, a difficult question to answer sure. um, because I'm just going to give you a sentence with which to answer it. Stefano Domenicali, you've got a new CEO um, at Formula mm -hmm. One. In one sentence, what are you expecting from the new boss? Positive forward growth, carrying on Chase's legacy and vision and That's equally nice. adapting that for his own Good. Yes, it's a multi-clausal sentence, but I like it a lot. Um, uh, Chloe Target Adams, Global Director of Race Promotion, thank you very much indeed. So to round off uh, this uh, s session, the first session here um, on Leaders Live, we're going to be joined by Stacey Allister. She's CEO of Pro Tennis at the USTA, uh, tournament director for the first time um, of the US Open, just gone. She spoke to David Kushnan a little earlier. Stacey Allister, great to have you with us. Um, a few weeks on from the US Open, uh, give us your assessment of, of how it went from a, an organizational and an operational point of view. Well, with the two weeks uh, behind us to now uh, uh, see a little bit more clear, uh, we're really um, pleased with the operations of the four week uh, Return to play that we had. We had the Western and Southern Open first, an ATP Master Series and a WTA Tier 1, along with uh, the historic 2020 US Open. Um, and I think you can, I can tell you uh, what I thought, but I also uh, am enjoying uh, the player feedback that we're now receiving. Because uh, when you're in the moment, it was an incredibly different environment for the athletes, uh, for coaches, for our staff. And, uh, you know, if we, we looked back at headlines in the beginning, oh, it's too strict, uh, the protocols are too... <clears throat> and now, uh, I think they're understanding uh, that what everything we did do was for, for them and for, the, for their health and well-being and the optimization of their performance. And uh, that ultimately is what we wanted. We wanted our sport to return to play in a safe and healthy way. And that ultimately is what we were able to achieve. Was that the most challenging element of it, almost the, the bit outside of the facility itself when you're talking about the hotels and the, the organization outside your own property, if you like? I do think uh, staging the largest event in the world since the global uh, pandemic, it wasn't just a sports event. Um, and the number of people involved on site uh, was, was uh, in the thousands. So managing everyone's mitigating risk and the health and well-being for all was an hourly, uh, diligent, uh, disciplined uh, experience from you know day one to the end of last ball, and even even last ball, <clears throat> we were still uh, those same health and safety protocols uh, were in play. So, and it's you know we communicated a lot in advance. Without question, uh, we can tell someone 10 times, they might understand 10% of what you tell them. And um, <clears throat> it, really getting everyone to understand the fundamentals of how we can return to work in COVID and collectively protect ourselves and the responsibility that we each had to ourselves with demographic differences, cultural differences, 
Um, <clears throat> it was quite an exercise, not just in health and safety, but also in, in communications and relationship management. If you had to go back and, and do it all over again, and I'm sure you wouldn't want to, uh, would there be anything? Right, yeah, it's too early to be thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, understood. Um, would there be anything that you uh, would have changed? Um, I think on this this exercise of getting the athletes and staff and and coaches um, to understand. The, the why we, we are going to wear our mask all the time, um, the physical distancing, um, <clears throat> the close contact, uh, more uh, maybe video communication, uh, multiple languages, because certainly um, majority of our customers, English is not their native language, uh, that I, I think we could have layered on to that. But um, those are, you know, some some elements because what I do know is that our uh, incredible team executed the plan in accordance with the, the government approvals that we received. And the fact that we, you know, we delivered over 15, administered over 15,000 tests and we had three tier groups and we had in that period of time, um, two positive tests, one with a trainer and one with an athlete and all of those people, uh, that did test positive or were in close contact, and we had a few in our tier two group uh, test positive. Everyone remains healthy, asymptomatic, and <clears throat> our sport then traveled back to Europe, and we saw a very, very successful Italian Open. So the bubble to the bubble environment, and uh, we're seeing now Roland Garros, seeing you know hardly any. Uh, positive cases in the main draw because all of those players had competed in New York. We saw some at the beginning because uh, Roland Garros had qualifying, whereas we didn't, which was again to be to be expected. How have you been working with uh, some of your other key stakeholder groups? I'm thinking broadcast crews, obviously commercial partners, and and what what was the reaction? What's the feedback been from from those groups? Well, we. Uh, <clears throat> We were fortunate uh, through the entire journey of sort of a six month uh, journey to decide um, how to adapt to COVID, whether we were having the event, not having it in New York, not in New York, uh, in August, in the fall, um, et cetera. And through that process, they were always supportive and never put any pressure on us to stage the event. And then when we decided were going to stage it, they were all in, and then it was the discussions around how did we adapt their commercial benefits and to ESPN, who took the role as the world feed uh, for the world to see, and I know that you uh, got to watch, um, got to see these inspiring athletes, um, how we were going to adapt our product for our fans who were going to watch the U.S. Open in two hundred countries. So it was, you know, you can talk about partnership, but it's that same ongoing, transparent, candid, with humility communication. And Lou Shear, our chief uh, of executive commercial growth and strategy, you know, he and his team did a phenomenal job with our business partners. And when you think about it, you need partners to be able to have the finances to be able to do it. We need the players, we need the support of the tours, and it's that collaborative team spirit that will you were able to stage the most historic U.S. Open in our history. Two great champions crowned, of course, in Naomi Osaka and uh, Dominic Team. Um, once they had lifted their respective trophies uh, for you and the team at the USTA, what, what, what has the debrief process looked like since then? Well, I'll be completely honest with you. We have just started. So uh, we all departed on you know, September 14th from New York, or, and uh, it's been pretty quiet. Um, there's been uh, some engagement at the international level, uh, um, things happening at Grand Slam level and in the ATP, WTI. But we as a management team just met yesterday for the first time. 
And so that process is happening with my team. We've started to reflect on what we learned and what worked well that we want to take forward. And uh, I think we are really focusing on a forward looking approach versus uh, looking, looking back um, and analyzing too much of, of what maybe didn't go exactly the way we would have uh, liked, but, uh, but what we're going to take forward for 2021. Yeah, and with that in mind, thinking about 2021, how on earth do you go about the process of trying to plan what the US Open next year looks like, given the financial uncertainty, given the continuing health uncertainty? There's not a lot that is certain in the world at the moment. Uh, what is your plan? Well, again, really early stages and very, very preliminary and high level and, and, and the timing of our chat is, is uh, appropriate. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to start that process with a 21 lens. Uh, we will build three models. We will build the no fan model. Uh, I think we have to plan for that scenario. We are hoping that uh, there will be the possibility of 50% fans and 75, we are not going to model 100% fans. Um, so that's a, <clears throat> that, that may happen, but I think we're a, you know, a fairly conservative and pragmatic organization. Uh, the US Open funds our sport and uh, we need to make sure that we're not overestimating what might be possible. So we're gonna sort of use the baseline of what our cuts were from 2020, um, pull out of the parking lot, maybe some initiatives that we had, we weren't able to, uh, to look at in 20, see which ones for 2021, especially having fans back, and then um, go through this adaptive world of what it would mean to have fans coming to the USTA Billie Jean King National Tennis Center in sort of a mobile touchless kind of in environment and how we, again, mitigate risk for the health and well-being for all. We will have many event organizers uh, watching this, um, events big, medium and, and small all around the world. Um, what, what words of wisdom as somebody who has just been through it would you have for them trying to plan uh, and map out what their event looks like at this moment? Be incredibly um, diligent, disciplined uh, at all stages to mitigate risk for the health and well-being for all. Do not underestimate or take any shortcuts around COVID. You know, and it, it's, it isn't, it isn't, it is hard, but it's not hard. Uh, if you listen to uh, the medical doctors, the public health officials, the recipe is simple. Wear your mask, keep your distance, be mindful of close contact, air filtration, and um, be agile. You know, every day it felt like we were getting a new deck of cards. Live events, we all know stuff's gonna happen. That's live events, right? Uh, like you're gonna lose your number one seed. Um, <laughs> Stuff happens. Uh, those, those are competition elements. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, brings us all back for sport. But in this medical world and dealing with governments, every day it's a new deck of cards. And you're having to make crisis decisions hourly with a lot of unknowns because you haven't followed the, the, the been in the territory or in those shoes before. The same fundamentals of crisis management, whether it's terrorism, um, weather, uh, natural disasters that in, can impact uh, your events, same principles apply. And um, just having that relentless spirit and mindset that you can do it, but it's going to take uh, discipline and a very, very passionate and dedicated team. And that's what we had in New York. Well, congratulations on making the tournament happen, uh, Stacey, and good luck with all the decisions that you'll, you'll have to make in the next few uh, weeks and months, and very good to have you with us. Thank you, David. Stay safe.